Greetings, family. I greet you in the words of peace. Shalom. Assalamu alaikum. Hotep. Alafia. And as always, race first. This edition of Garveyism Versus, we will be dealing with Garveyism versus cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation is defined as the unacknowledged or inappropriate adoption of the customs, practices, ideas, etc., of one people or society by members of another and typically more dominant people or society. This definition here, uh, I clipped this picture from Origin of Everything. Go check her channel out. She breaks down things very nice. So you may remember these instances of cultural appropriation with uh, Jessica Krug and Rachel Dolezal. Uh, Dolezal, of course, was the NAACP president, and Jessica Krug was a African studies professor, I believe. All right, passing as black women, but they were really white. So I asked a sister one time, dealing with appropriation and respect and things like that. I said, hey. Could you imagine if someone was just wearing pink and green and running around pretending to be an AKA? And the sister said to me, no, absolutely not. That is just plain disrespectful. And that's sort of the point I wanted to get to today. But while we're talking, I'm going to show you a little something. Like, why would it be considered disrespectful? Because clearly you see on the shirt here, it says 1908. The AKA have a history from 1908, and it's disrespectful to imitate that history and that legacy just for fun, let's say, or for any other matter. All right, move forward. All right, so there was another situation here. There's a movie out right now um, where uh, there's white girls in black sororities it's actually a real thing there are white women in aka as a matter of fact sigma gamma rule all of the rest um and that doesn't necessarily count as cultural appropriation however it is disrespectful to imitate what they are doing without what we say first acknowledging where you got it from and doing it respectfully some folks uh may remember in the 90s there was a song called ice ice eight by vanilla ice all right. And others who are in the know may remember that there was a controversy between the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity and that song because the actual phrase ice, ice, faith is part of their step routine. OK, they actually considered going to court over it. Here's an article from the Sphinx magazine dealing with the um, AFIA. Uh, what do they do when someone is perpetrating the frat? And then they question whether or not they should uh, sue Vanilla Ice for using their chant. Again, it's an issue of respect moving forward. Here you see an utter disrespect. You see a Native American man here holding his middle fingers up to where black is brown, the African diaspora in Mexico. This video is a little crazy. I'm not really going to show it, but just I wanted to highlight the fact that there are Native Americans who actually have an issue with the African-centric view of the world. Here's another uh, book here titled Thieves of Civilization, Afrocentric Attempts to Appropriate the Cultural Heritage of Native Americans and Latino Indo Mestizos in America. And the one thing, the reason I really showed this, I wanted to point out the fact that that book costs almost $900. There's a reason for that. When you're trying hard to disprove or even prove something, you know what I mean? The research <laughs> and the books involved are very expensive. Moving forward. So the reason we're here today, we're gonna to deal with the philosophy of identity and appropriation. How all of those things we just discussed culminate in uh, what is the Garveyite perspective on them? All right, moving forward. We'll do a little bit of a thought experiment here. Uh, the ship of Theseus. Theseus. As the planks of Theseus's ship needed repair, it was replaced part by part up to a point where not one single part from the original ship remained anymore. Is it then still the same ship? Think about that for a minute. But the second part of this thought experiment 
is what we're going to focus focus on on this presentation. If all the discarded parts were used to build another ship, which of the two, if either, is the real ship of Theseus? So now the history of the ship of Theseus, it was docked in the Bay of Theseus and they wanted to keep it as a historical monument. The waves and water were damaging the ship. So over the years, they replaced part by part, plank by plank, uh, each part of the ship until it was a brand new ship, basically. But it was still the ship of Theseus, or was it? So now, if all of those pieces that were taken off of that ship were used to then build another ship, okay, that's what we're dealing with today. So now you have the original ship of Theseus here on the left, which for this part we're going to call Ship A. As it gets uh, repaired through the years, planks come off. And mind you, this thought experiment we're dealing with, let's just say that there's a thousand planks or parts. So the mast, the sail, the steering wheel, all of that. Okay. One part at a time, it's replaced to build a new ship. So the original ship has all new parts, brand new parts. We're going to call that ship B. And ship C has all the old parts. So which one is the original ship of Theseus? What we're going to do here is look at this in from a Garveyite perspective. Let's change it a little bit and call it the ship of Garvey. All right, the same ship is made of a thousand planks. Okay, and if all of the removed parts were used to build another ship, which one of those two, if either, is the real ship of Garvey? Here we are. We got it demonstrated for you here. Same same description. All right, throughout the years, pieces are used from one ship. To build another ship all right replacement parts are there so which one is it we got a over here and we have ship b at the top and ship c at the bottom which one would be the real ship of garvey moving forward what if that process was then repeated multiple times in fact there is a response to it there's an actual solution to the ship of theseus thought experiment but that we're not really looking for the actual solution to that right now I'm trying to uh, give you a diagram and a description so it'll, it'll stick in your mind as far as what we're really dealing with today. All right. So if each of the, if the ship of Garvey is broken down and all of the parts are then spread out amongst many small different ships, it then makes those ships smaller, less efficient, and weaker than the original ship. So what are we talking about when we say Garvey's ship? We are talking about the Pan-African government of the world, the UNIAACL. Now, it's also a philosophy we're talking about, Garveyism in itself. When taking pieces of Garveyism and building other movements, rather than building up the one movement to make it strong, we are taking away and making it weaker and less efficient. Let's move forward. Here are several organizations, people, individuals, groups, whatever you want to go with, that have used parts of the ship of Garvey in building their own ship. You take them over here. I thought one that was interesting was Jesse Jackson, Farrakhan, George Augustus Stalling, all right, Lawrence Ham, interesting. Moving forward. Here we see some more influences of the ship of Garvey, the commandment keepers, the foundation of what we see now as the Black Hebrew Israelite movement, all right, was founded by Rabbi Wentworth Matthew. And here in the red, you see Matthew wove together the threads of Marcus Garvey's Black nationalism with the Hebrew Bible. Moving forward, over here, you see the Reverend Albert, Albert Cleve, okay, in 1978, evolved the Pan African Orthodox Church, which grew out of Marcus Garvey's UNIA. All right, there's an excellent speech with him on YouTube where he gives the uh, Black Christian Nationalist Church creed, and he reads it out at the end, he says, now that's a creed indeed. It's an awesome speech, you go listen to it. So that's Hebrew, is Hebrew Israelite uh, doctrine, the modern Black power Christian church doctrine, and of course we have to go to Black Islam. This book asks the question, is Elijah Muhammad the offspring of noble Drew Ali? and Marcus Garvey. Interesting question. 
one other point. Remember that book that they were working so hard to disprove and prove and that other one that cost almost $900. This one only costs four. Moving forward. In Message to the Black Man, written by Elijah Muhammad, he acknowledges Garvey himself and says, like Marcus Garvey, Elijah Muhammad is building his movement on a non-white basis. And you see here on this entire page, he shows the influences of Marcus Garvey on the Nation of Islam movement. Here you see another example. Mainly we show in these pictures just so you can see that the actual uniforms of the Black Cross nurses are the uniforms of today's MGT in the Nation of Islam. All right. Moving forward, Noble Drew Ali, the Holy Prophet, you see this was written by him, where he says, in these modern days there came a forerunner who was divinely prepared by the great God Allah, and his name was Marcus Garvey. All right, so we see that he acknowledges that the forerunner of the MSTA is Marcus Garvey. Moving forward. So we have an example of Nation of Islam, Moorish Science Temple. Again, we're dealing with the Washita Moorish Nation. All right. Again, inspired by the UNIACL, as you see by their flag. Okay. Also speaking about the descendants of Africa who have crossed the Atlantic. All right, moving forward. Oh, one other point here. You see at the bottom it says Washita Moor Indians were recognized by the United Nations in 1993. All right. Being recognized by another government is a way that nations and governments become nations and governments. So here's an example of how another nation and government recognized UNIA ACL government of the world and actually had a tree, a land tree, for a dollar an acre for uh, 247 acres in Liberia with the rubber trees. Foundational Black Americans, American descendants of slavery, and aboriginals. If you look on the FBA website, you will see that the three stars on their flag, let's zoom in on that flag for a moment, if we can. All right, the three stars on their flag represent the groups that will become the foundational Black Americans. Okay, three stars at the top, remember that, okay? Two of the stars, well, the first one it says the Black Aboriginal people of North America, granted. The next two stars say the Black explor explorers and traders who had contact with the Americas before Columbus. And the third one says the captives brought to Western Hemisphere from Africa. Both of those second two stars are Africans, admittedly so. Moving down, where you see the American descendants of slavery, their guide, their guide criteria for eligibility for to be an ADOS is an individual who could provide reasonable documentation of at least one ancestor enslaved in the United States. And they would need to demonstrate that they have identified as Black, African American, colored, or Negro on established legal documents for at least 10 years prior to the onset of this program, meaning the ADOS program. Also at the bottom, it excludes any black immigrant who came to the United States voluntarily after slavery, all right? So basically what they're saying, again, on their websites, you'll see that any, anybody who was here in America as a quote unquote immigrant before 1865 would fit that description. If they were a slave or an ancestor was a slave before 1865, they fit the description, all right? So I wanted to point out here the fact that they, as an ethnic group or a nation, they have created flags, all right? And we're dealing with the unification of not only the Black Aboriginals here in North America, but also the Africans from around the world, all right? So is there any difference between those movements and the UNIA? Could they have been influenced? But of course. Without the UNIACL, you wouldn't even have that discussion. We have put together in the Declaration of Rights and Negro Peoples of the World, Declaration Number Two, it says that we believe in the supreme authority of our race in all things racial, 
that all things are created and given to man as a common possession and that there should be an equitable distribution and apportionment of all such things. And in consideration of the fact that as a race, we are now deprived of those things that are morally and legally ours, we believe it right that all things should be acquired and held by whatsoever means possible. That right there was signed into law in 1920. Again, in consideration of the fact that as a race, we are now deprived of those things that are morally and legally ours. So that means the legal uh, part of the Eidos uh, FBA argument was already codified in the UNIA ACO Declaration of Rights and Negro Peoples of the World. Because wherever you are domiciled, the UNIA was to be a, a, a base to support what you're doing. So let's move forward. Here we see John Edward Bruce. As a matter of fact, let us zoom in a little bit so we can see that it's not lying, making things up. What does it say in the first line there? John Edward Bruce was born into slavery. Okay. Why is that important? Why is John Edward Bruce important in this discussion on Garvey's perspective? Because he was a high-ranking official in the UNIA ACL and a founding member. Here over on the right, you see his own words. Okay. I do not understand your Back to Africa movement slogan to mean what the critics have mischievously interpreted it to mean. I think I see with tolerably clear vision that your purpose is to lay the foundation broad and deep so that the Negroes of the coming day will know better than we who are now blazing the pathway and preparing the race for African nationalization, how to possess and hold and develop the heritage which the Almighty has given to the Black race, okay? So when we're talking about Pan-Africanism and a Pan-African government of the world, that does not exclude the missions and movements that are happening in different parts of the world Okay, we are a world people. If our people are in distress anywhere, we should have a foundation and a base to support them. Okay, so again, I don't see there so far, we don't have any differences between the FBA and ADOS movement moving forward. Who else? Ida B. Wells. Everyone knows her story and how outspoken she was on slavery, her history with slavery, etc. Okay, she, clearly, you see here together with Garvey, original Garveyite. Moving forward, people say Garveyism is hero worship. Okay, we cleared this up in a different um, presentation, but just to go into a couple things here, Garvey was not alone. Remember, he left Jamaica in 1916 to meet Booker T. Washington to see if he can get a Tuskegee Institute built in Jamaica. In Harlem, the founders were Isaac B. Allen, Irina Mormon Blackston, Walter Conway, Carrie Merrill, Harriet Rogers, okay? Have we looked into their history? Well, let's take a moment. Here you see the very top, the, the, the headline of the story. Let's go over here and check it out. He was born a slave. Isaac B. Allen elected um, to serve in the Congress, in, I'm sorry, to, concert, to serve in the governor's council, okay? Isaac B. Allen, who is the first colored man in any northern state to be elected counselor to a governor, was born a slave in Hampton, Virginia, 52 years ago. And he was a founding member. Moving over, Irene, well, let's go through it. You see here, it says, three of the six directors listed on a certificate of incorporation were women. Carrie B. Merrill, an activist from Massachusetts, and Harlemites, Harriet Rogers, and Irene Blackstone, okay? Here's a breakdown on Irene Blackstone, okay? All this here. Here you go over here with Carrie Merrill, okay? No race has succeeded without a good and strong womanhood. Okay, and some never will. Uh-oh, here we go. Over here to the right, well, no, all the way to the bottom, you see Walter Conway. All right, he was the first vice president. All right. Okay. Moving over here, we see 
black people of the world had only progressed from ch chattel slavery to economic slavery. Okay, that was the position from back then, this position now, and any slavery should be rec um, recompensated. Okay, to use the word from the Empress. Okay, and one more time, he came from Jamaica to meet Booker T. Washington because he read the book Up From Slavery, all right? Because we were slaves all over the world. So if we can find a unifying way to gain benefit for all our people wherever they are domiciled, whatever their procedures need, uh, uh, are, we can collectively work on fixing it. All right, moving forward. So you see here, this is all the list of the founders. We could go through all of their histories and things like that, how many of them were from America and how many of them have descendants of slaves. But you understand that this was not the purpose. Division is not the purpose of us. We're supposed to come together, okay? It is not the position of the UNIA that we would infringe on a, uh, a check that some one individual will receive based on their lineage. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. It would be the position of the UNIA ACL to assist you in getting your check and not need any compensation for it. Moving forward. For the aboriginals, here you see two prominent aboriginal leaders of the time, Fred Maynard and Tom Lacey became Garveyites and viewed Garveyism as an answer to aboriginal issues in Australia. Okay, so uh, you have to remember that the term aborigine and aboriginal was made uh, more of a common usage word because of the struggles of uh, the Australian Aboriginal. Okay, so that wasn't always a word that everyone used. You know, neither was indigenous. We sort of just knew. But somehow, in these times, we're confused about these things. Moving forward. Again, we see that we believe in the supreme authority of our race and all things race. Okay, and everything that we're supposed to have as a people, it don't matter what it is, or who specifically is supposed to have. If one person is supposed to have $47, we are to make sure that that person has his $47 and not expect anything from it, okay? And however it has to happen, you see down here at the bottom, by whatsoever means possible. Is that familiar to you? It should be because it is the famous quote from the Honorable Malcolm X when he created the Organization of Afro-American Unity another organization influenced by the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. You see here, the motto of the organization was, we want justice by any means necessary. We want equality by any means necessary. Moving forward, Kwame Nkrumah, the very black star on his flag is a reference to his teacher and influence, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. He even gave reference to Garvey himself. Right. See here, a shiny tribute to the inspiration of Marcus Garvey. Moving forward, even Ho Chi Minh was influenced by Marcus Garvey, took a couple of those planks from the ship of Garvey and built his own ship. All right, for North Vietnam freedom mm -hmm. and liberation. Moving forward, here in America, the Yellow Power Movement, okay, the Pan Asian American Movement, right, got. Uh, let's see who and the Red Power Movement, okay, the Pan Indian Movement, all got their influence from what the Black Power Movement, okay. And you, uh, let's see the Black Power Movement here from Stokely Carmichael or uh, Kwame Ture, okay. See up the right, it says, We had no more courage than Harriet Tubman or Marcus Garvey had in their time. We just had a more vulnerable enemy. What's he talking about? He's talking about the ability to influence politics, actually because that was the purpose of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. It was a party for, it was a political party, all right? Where do you get that from? Brother Malcolm X tells you that Black nationalism is a self-help political philosophy, okay? It means that we're supposed to control the politicians in our own communities, and that philosophy is a philosophy that eliminates the necessity for division and argument. Moving forward. Where do you get it from? Of course, the Garvey parents of Malcolm X. Here you see him with a quote, Garvey had the feeling of the black man at heart, right? Moving forward. Again, we're dealing with the political parties. 
all of which were influenced by Marcus Messiah Garvey. You see, he created the very first modern political party in Jamaica in 1929. All right, here are some of the initi initiatives in his manifesto, um, the 14 point um, manifesto that again was um, part of the political system in Jamaica until at least 1962. All right, moving forward. So here we see the Black Panther costume party. We're talking about cultural appropriation. Um, I know here in my city, we have a lot of folks who have the costume of the Panthers, but aren't really trying to utilize the mission of the Panthers. Let's move forward. Again, you see the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was actually a political party. You see the breakfast program, the free food program, and the schools program that they put together to teach our people uplift our people and of course in the middle you see protect our people all right moving forward here you see another organization that many people are unaware of the us organization depicted in the movie panther 1995 uh you see them here uh on the right this is an actual picture of them alana karenga was the leader is the leader of the uh, us organization here is their logo and over here, all the way in the upper right corner, you see the colors of their flag. The colors of the Kwanzaa flag are the colors of the organization US, black, red, and green. And if you remember the movie, they did a lot with the cup, okay? The Kikombe Chao Moja or the Unity Cup. They just kept saying libation throughout that part of the movie, right? <laughs> Moving forward. Queen Mother Makinya, known as the mother of Kwanzaa, okay? touted with the creation of the seven day uh, ritual, all right? Instead of just doing one, one day, I believe it was on her to do seven days, all right? Moving forward. Again, this is from the Kwanzaa website. You see that the Kwanzaa flag is the color of the organization, us, black, red, and green. They put black first because the people come first, then red for the struggle, and then finally green is for the people's future. And we know Marcus Garvey's flag stands for the red for the blood that is, shed for our liberation, black for the skin that is a symbol of pride, and green for the luxurious mother Africa. So you see in the middle here, you see the two flags, the contrasting flags. We also see that the seven principles actually come directly from a speech that Marcus Garvey gave in 1923, again in 1924, where you see each of the seven principles came directly from uh, the aims and objectives of the UNIAACL. Here is the speech. You'll be able to take the pieces out uh, yourself if you look at it carefully. To develop an expansive society among the nation and race. To assist the development of independent Negro communities. A humanitarian spirit of pride and love. To work for the general uplift of the Negro peoples of the world. To conserve the rights of our noble race to work for better conditions among Negroes everywhere. And with love and charity, establish universities, colleges, ac academies, and schools for the racial education and culture of the people. Okay, these are the seven principles of Kwanzaa and also parts of the aims and objectives of the UNIA ACL Pan-African Government of the World. Here's some more influences of the ship of Garvey. Even the W.E.B. Dubois took parts of the ship. Let me just read one of his quotes here. The next step then is certainly one on the part of the Negro and it involves group action. It involves the organization of intelligent and earnest people of Negro descent for their preservation and advancement in America, in the West Indies and in Africa. And no sentimental distaste for racial or national unity can be allowed to hold them back from a step which sheer necessity demands. Now that may sound familiar. Those of you that are paying attention would know that that is Garveyism. One of the first to notice the change in Dubois was Garvey himself. After reading a Dubois commencement speech, Garvey loudly accused Dubois of now preaching Garveyism in 1930 and Dubois had referred in that speech to the need for black economic base. In the 1931 Negro world, made the same point. The headlines declared, 
Dr. Dubois agrees with the UNIA leader and takes program over finally, but does not openly confess it, emphasizes Negro-owned industries and business. This new line of thinking led inevitably to a break between Dubois and his integrationist employers at the NAACP. Dubois, in his own words, is now advocating new, deliberate, and purposeful segregation for the economic defense of our race. All right, in 1934, he and the NAAC parted company. So when they say he takes the program over finally, you must remember that in 1916, when Gary was coming to, before he even got to Harlem, I believe, he sent a letter to W.B. Du Bois to see if he could become the leader of the race. It was Garvey's position that because Dubois had already had a, an established following and was um, well known, that he would be a good person to lead our race. Uh, Dubois sent a letter back saying no. Um, and he actually was in attendance at the 1920 uh, convention and still did everything he could do to destroy the economic base that he started to speak about in 1930. Moving forward, so the uh, race first and Black Lives Matter. So the NAACP leader, Black Lives Matter, all of that in modern times. You see here to the left, Garvey was the forerunner to those things. Remember that forerunner word again? Who said that? The noble Trulli. That forerunner thing keep coming up to Garvey. So let's look back at the ship of Garvey again. We see all of these different groups scattered around with different missions, which seems like they're all the same mission. It would make sense then that we start piecing things back together. We see the success of these different organizations. You see what they look like in them and the response that they got. But just remember that when we were all together, we look different. There's a different feeling when we come together. When the UNIA ACL was at its height with all of the millions of members that they had, all believing different things as far as religion and different political stances, you know what I'm saying? We still were together and super strong as a race, as a nation. And if we come back together, just imagine what we would look like. Just really look at this. This is the Universal African Legion at the top here. Imagine if all of the different groups, Nation of Islam, the US organization, MSTA, Black Lives Matter, every, all of the uh, countries in Ghana, and I mean, in, in, in Africa, and the Black Panther Party, all came together or never broke away from in the first place. Just imagine what we would look like today. Just imagine if we still had the Black Star Line. Imagine if we still had the Negro Factories Corporation the Universal African Legion and the African Motor Corps, the Negro World Newspaper, the Black Cross Nurses, treaties and land deals for our people around the world, or even the UNIA ACL Air Force that people keep forgetting about, the Black Eagles Flying Corps. These things were all things that we had when we were together. So the question in August of 2020 was, why won't we listen to Marcus Garvey? When we see these different pieces of the original coming out, all we can see is pieces missing from the original. If the foundation is being removed piece by piece, what then can we expect to stand on it? So then the solution must be for us to piece by piece rebuild the government rebuild the nation, rebuild the success of our people so we can be like the, the Pledge of Allegiance said, where we commit our mind, body, and spirit to the defense, protection, and security of the red, black, and green and rebuild the ship of Garvey. My people, all of the different movements, whatever you already doing, if it's in the interest of black people, we should link it all together and move forward with it. The UNIA ACL is a government structure that was set up in 1920 for us to build and to be great. It was to support us no matter where we were. In the Honorable Marcus Garvey's words, Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. We are abroad if you're not already on the continent. Meaning 
our continent or our people, wherever we are, should be able to support each other. Otherwise, we are a nation merely missing pieces. Family, unification is a must. There is no other solution. Join your local UNIA ACL today. In the words and the model of our glorious ancestors, one God, one aim, one destiny, and as always, race first. <laughs>